then you don't see the major features as clearly. So Mark is helpful to us in that way. It's a little bit of a, a deviation from how Mark is in other parts where he gives us extra details. So we're very thankful for what he has given us. Last week, we, of course, the Holy, what the Holy Spirit has given us through Mark. Last week, we looked at the first five verses of Mark 15. We saw how the Sanhedrin, the, the highest court of the Old Testament church, was made up of the high priests, some other priests, also the elders of the people and some of the scribes, that uh, they eagerly brought Jesus to Pilate accusing him to Pilate, Roman governor, of claiming to be the king of the Jews. Jesus affirmed that it was so, and he did not try to defend himself against their charges, even the, some of the false charges that they made and the confused charges that they made, because he was there to bear the sin of his people, and there was no defense that could be given for his people's sins. As the Son of God who became flesh, He was the only one who could atone for their sins. He had to offer Himself to suffer the pains of hell for them on the cross. He was willingly subjecting Himself to be punished in our place. Pilate was left to marvel to see a prisoner who was being sentenced to, to be crucified or was threatened with that to not, and who, who seemed in his mind to be innocent of any treasonous actions, to see him refraining from defending himself. Usually someone would be desperate to do so. Mark emphasizes that Jesus does not try to defend himself in that section we looked at last week. This week, we're going to look at verses 6 through 15. The emphasis here is on the choice that the people were given between Barabbas, the insurrectionist, and Jesus, the king of the Jews. Pilate, in a ploy to obtain the release of Christ, puts this choice before the people. Mark focuses his narrative on this choice. As readers for whom the word of God was written, then we need to consider the fact that there is a similar choice before us and before all people as to who we are going to serve. Today, I want to put this before you all. So please give attention now as I read the passage to you. It is Mark 15, beginning in verse 6. This is the word of God. Now at the feast, he was accustomed to releasing one prisoner to them, whomever they requested. And there was one named Barabbas, who was chained with his fellow rebels and had committed murder in the rebellion. Then the multitude, crying aloud, began to ask him to do just as he had always done for them. But Pilate answered them, saying, Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priest had handed him over because of envy. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd so that he should rather release Barabbas to them. Pilate answered and said to them again, What then do you want me to do with him whom you call the king of the Jews? So they cried out again, Crucify him. Then Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? But they cried out all the more, Crucify him. So Pilate, wanting to gratify the crowd, released Barabbas to them, and he delivered Jesus after he had scourged him to be crucified. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his holy and infallible word. Now, I, just, I want to mention something to you before uh, we proceed here. I have a tendency for some reason to say Barnabas rather than Barabbas. So if I say Barabbas, just, I mean, if I say Barnabas, just know that I meant Barabbas. I'm not preaching about Barnabas today. Barnabas was a very faithful man in Acts, but um, it's Barabbas all the way through. <laughs> Just wanted to clarify that so I won't have to if I stumble along with it. Okay, well, you can see in this passage that, that Pilate is in a bit of a fix. 
the Sanhedrin, again, the highest court of the church of the Old Testament, brought Jesus to Pilate, the Roman governor, declaring that he is guilty of claiming to be their king, the king of the Jews. The implication, of course, is that Jesus is presenting himself as another king in place of the Roman emperor Tiberius, who had the dominion over the Jews at this time. Pilate, of course, would have been very suspicious of this accusation right from the start because these were people that, that hated the emperor and they were, kind of, they were quite pleased, actually, and would have been very pleased if someone had overthrown him, a Jew had overthrown him, and become their king. So for them to come like all worried about you know, somebody that's claiming to be king, uh, it, 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 was, it, it raised some, uh, you know, okay, this is, there's something else going on here. Um, as it says in verse 10, he knew that the Sanhedrin were acting in envy. He knew that Jesus had gotten, of course, he had intelligence of what was going on too and knew a lot about what was going on. He saw a lot of what was going on. He saw crowds of people that were going to hear Jesus teach, probably knew about the triumphal entry. We don't know all that he knew, but he certainly, imagine he would have known all of those things when uh, his advisors would have spoken to him. And he's, uh, he, he's, he realizes that Jesus was getting a little too popular for the comfort of uh, the Sanhedrin. And uh, they were wanting to use Pilate as their henchman to, to do him in. And after examining Christ, Pilate was fully convinced that Jesus had done nothing worthy of punishment for the high crime of treason. He saw rightly that Jesus was not a revolutionary who was looking to overthrow Rome by force with the point of a sword and spear. Yet the Sanhedrin were adamant, and Pilate did not want to contradict them if he did not have to. Since he knew, here's a bit of a schemer, you know, you sort of have to be if you're a Roman governor, I guess, especially of the uh, trying to govern the, the Jewish people that didn't like him. None of them liked him. Uh, so since he knew that Jesus was popular with the people, he devised what he thought would be a very clever plan. When he saw the crowd starting to gather to make their customary request that they made every year at Passover for a prisoner to be released, Pilate had granted amnesty to a prisoner that he had, Rome had taken and they could ask for one of their own that they didn't want to see condemned to be released. So Pilate, rather than opposing the Sanhedrin himself by refusing to condemn Jesus, Pilate thought he could easily get the people to call for the release of Jesus. Since Jesus had been delivered to him because of envy, he supposed that the crowd would be happy to oppose the Sanhedrin and ask for Jesus to be released. And then you wouldn't have to, Pilate wouldn't have to deal with it. Oh, this was the people's choice. You know, that's what he would be able to say. But this really wasn't so clever. It was actually a gross miscalculation. The delight the Jews had in this custom. Now think about this. They were a people that were under occupation by the, the Romans. The Romans had, had taken dominion over them. They didn't like that at all. So the delight that they had in this custom of releasing a prisoner was in gaining the release of someone that was an antagonist to Rome. That was the whole point. And Jesus had not been taken prisoner by Rome. He had been taken prisoner by the Sanhedrin. They were not in a mind to give Pilate, a, a governor that none of them liked, the release of the prisoner that, that Pilate wanted to be released. It was easy for the Sanhedrin then to convince them to ask for Barabbas instead. Pilate did not realize that many of Jesus' followers would not even have been there. They would have had better things to do than to ask amnesty for someone that had been taken prisoner by Rome on, during the Passover. There were a lot of more important things for them to be engaged in. Of course, at this time, there was a lot of distress for the ones that knew what had happened to Jesus. Many of course, would not have probably yet received the news about that. 
but uh, it was only uh, expected in, under the case that those who were gathered here would be looking for the release of one of their freedom fighters. As we look at this passage and how it relates to us, let's begin by looking at the options that are here. Barabbas or Jesus. The people were asked to declare which of these they wanted. This is a question that confronts us down through the ages. Do we want Jesus or do we want some other deliverer? some other scheme of salvation. Consider these two candidates. First, we will look at Barabbas, the insurrectionist. It's interesting the way Mark first introduces him as one named or one called Barabbas. When we consider that the name means son of the father, Bar means son, Abba means father, Mark's wording that he was called the son of the father is suggestive that he was not actually the son of the father in the way that Jesus was the son of the father. Of course, the name could simply mean that he was the son of a father, certainly though someone important would be in view here. And it's interesting that this name puts him as a competitor with Jesus. The name which he was called, Barabbas, suggests that he is a leader. And indeed he was. Apparently a popular one at that. So the question is, do you want the insurrectionist who is called the son of the father? Or do you want the king of the Jews who is also called the son of the father? There's even a, quite, a, quite a bit of evidence that Barabbas is name, his given name was actually Jesus as well. So it was, you know, really, do you want Jesus Barabbas? Or do you want Jesus Barabbas? They could both be called by, by that name. One is a title, and one is their actual given name. Of course, to keep things simple, I'm not going to call them by those, those, those names. I'm going to call Barabbas as he is called here, Barabbas, and Jesus, Jesus, as we, as the one who is our Lord. But Mark tells us that Barabbas was an insurrectionist. That is, he was a freedom fighter. He was one of the Jews who led the rebellion against Rome. And in doing so, he had been charged with murder, along with some of his companions with whom he was chained up in prison. Probably the others are the two men that were crucified on either side of our Lord Jesus. Barabbas was supposed to be the one in the middle. These men, as involved in the rebellion, the insurrection that was known even to Mark's readers when he wrote this, he didn't have to explain about it, were looking to free the Jews from Roman dominion. They hoped to follow in the footsteps of someone like Judas Maccabeus of old and his sons who had put up effective resistance against the Greeks in previous days. This was a very popular movement of the zealots in the time of Jesus. As we have seen, many who encountered Jesus at Galilee, who saw his divine power, very much desired and expected that Jesus would be the one who would lead them in rebellion against Rome. Remember when that whole uh, militia of men went went running around to meet Jesus when his disciples were going across the Sea of Galilee and they, they came and that's the time when they were, were pressing him to be king. Surely with his power to raise the dead, to heal the sick, to multiply loaves and fishes, he could lead them in triumph against the Romans as Moses had done of old, even Abraham had done when he rescued Lot as Joshua had done, as David had done, as Asa and Hezekiah, and so many others had led them against armies that were so much greater than they were, against the enemies that God had appointed them to go and to fight. So the Barabbas is the first candidate here, a freedom fighter, an insurrectionist. The second candidate for Pilate's release was Jesus Christ. 
he is presented by Pilate, and rightly so, as the king of the Jews. Jesus is that to be sure. John the baptizer proclaimed when Jesus came on the scene that the kingdom was at hand, and he presented Jesus as the king that had come to save his people from their sins. He is the son of David, who came indeed to set his people free from all of their enemies, to take not only the throne of David, but to take that throne forever, and to elevate that throne to the right hand of the Father until all of his enemies are made his footstool. He had demonstrated and declared that he was not only born of woman, but also that he was the Son of God. How many times did he tell them that I came from above? I was sent down from heaven and uh, from all eternity where he had reigned as one co-eternal and co-equal with the Father and equal in power. But his work had been disappointing to many in Israel and Jerusalem. While his teaching and his miracles were impressive, he did not lead the people to take up arms and overthrow the Romans. He lacked a revolutionary spirit. He had something else in mind, something that was actually far more important. And it was time for Israel and their maturation to understand and receive that thing that was far more important. He came to save his people and people from every nation of the world from their sins. He came to call people to repentance and to give his life a ransom to God for their sins as the way that God had promised to secure their pardon. His objective was to reconcile them to the Father and to bring them to him forever as his own. He was much more interested in freeing them from the rebellion that was in their heart and life against God than he was in leading them in rebellion against Rome. He had promised to come in his glory to judge the world at the last day. But his present agenda was to preach the gospel of reconciliation among the Gentiles, bearing reproach for him as a persecuted people. They would be persecuted. He told them so. They would be dragged before kings and governors. So in other words, because they were serving the Lord, they would be persecuted, but they would not go forth with arms to try to overthrow their enemies. We see that even Rome was defeated by simply the presence of these who followed Christ and proclaimed his name without wavering. It's a tremendous thing. But the crowds, you see, were, uh, were not really impressed by this. Even though he had promised to come in his glory and to judge the world at the last day, his present agenda, though, though was to preach the gospel of reconciliation among the, the nations. So at this juncture, there were many who had, or, or there were not many, who had identified with his purpose. There were a few Remember the woman that washed his feet? She seemed to be clearer than the disciples were at that time. And to some extent, of course, his disciples resonated with his purpose. They really didn't get it yet before the cross. Their understanding, their passion for what he had come to do still had lacked much. They did not understand the cross. It didn't, it didn't make sense to them. But the crowds as a whole, especially this mob that had initially come to Pilate to seek the release of a prisoner that Rome had taken, they had not been inflamed with a passion for the agenda to deliver, of Jesus to deliver the world from sin. That was not really very much of a, an interest of theirs. They rested in the fact that they were already God's people. And they saw a little need for the kind of giving his life a ransom type work that Jesus had come to do. It didn't really seem like it was necessary. They were unregenerate men who had not come to see their need of such radical measures. They, they were circumcised, they professed the name of the Lord, but they were unregenerate. Until Jesus actually went through with the cross and until reconciliation by the cross began to be proclaimed and the Holy Spirit was poured out in, the, in that ministry of the word, they didn't see a lot of hope in this, in this prophet from Galilee, that 
they were wondering who he was. You know, now here he was battered. Remember, he'd already had a beating and been spit upon by the, the, in the house of uh, the high priest. And here he is now, you know, bruised and in chains. And it appeared in the hands of the Roman governor, at the mercy of the Roman governor. So, yes, Barabbas had been arrested too. But at least as a hero who is putting up a fight. Surely he would do that again if he were released. So it was relatively easy for the Sanhedrin to persuade these people that Barabbas was the better choice. You need to see that the same two candidates are before you today. Barabbas represents salvation by the wisdom of and the power of man. Perhaps even men who are fighting what seems to be God's cause, which was the case with these insurrectionists. It was in the name of God that they fought. This has been a constant temptation in the world. We may go back to Cain when he, unlike his brother Abel, sought to gain the approval of God by his own works. This led to the brother, to to the murder of his brother Abel who looked to God in faith, who would not depend on his own works and righteousness. Cain was followed by many others who became mighty in the world, his descendants and those that came from him, but who pursued power and success without looking to God. They did not look to God to give them power and success, but much more they increasingly did not even pursue the agenda of God of holiness and sanctification. They did, not, they, they did not seek deliverance from sin and reconciliation with God by the grace of God. They followed Barabbas, you see, we could say. They became desperately wicked so that God destroyed the world with the great flood, sparing only Noah and his household, who, contrary to the rest of the world, looked to God for the salvation that he promised the salvation that would come by his son. But though only Noah's family was left after the great flood, the world didn't stay as a people of faith. Very quickly, they began to turn to Barabbas again. As they began to multiply, they came together at Babel to build a city, to make a great name for themselves. The problem, by their own power, They felt that by man, by Barabbas, they could make themselves secure and prosperous. They would do so in the strength of the way of man, in the strength and the way of man. The result would not be reconciliation with God, but an increasing independence from God, bringing them further and further from a holy walk with him and deeper and deeper into sin. That's what happens when we pursue man-made salvation rather than the salvation that God gives. Our own schemes rather than the call of God. The cause they were pursuing was not in itself bad. You know, I mean, they wanted to be secure. They wanted to be prosperous. They wanted to have a great name. Good name is to be chosen, you know. Uh, But in doing so, They were doing it in a way that led them away from God, that was not focused on trusting God and looking to God as their Savior that they needed. How important to consider then what we are pursuing. Is it the agenda of the Lord? Or is it a man-made agenda? Is it Barabbas? Lest all depart from him at Babel, God wouldn't let that happen. He wouldn't let them all depart from him. God confused their language and scattered them. And then he called Abraham, giving him the promise that he would bless him and make his name great, that he would protect him and that he would give him safety. In other words, God promised to Abraham, I hope you notice this when you read the Old Testament, he promised to Abraham the exact things that the people were looking for at Babel. 
The difference was is that God would give it in His way rather than them seizing hold of it in their way. But even with this promise to Abraham and his descendants, you would think, okay, now Abraham is set apart and his descendants as the people of faith. They're going to follow along in faith and the rest of the world will be following Barabbas. But no, the struggle continued between Barabbas, the one who saves by human power, and Christ, the one who saves by divine power. Even among these holy people set apart to God by his covenant with all their ordinances to testify to their need of salvation from sin and the promise of salvation in God's Son, they constantly gravitated to salvation by man. Like the passage that we read about, they were looking at Egypt to save them. Often they turned to the nations, Egypt, Assyria, whatever. Time and time again, they look for prosperity and blessing in the world without seeking salvation from their sin and growth in a holy walk with God. If they were seeking salvation, deliverance from sin and growth in a holy walk with God, then they would have seen God's hand of chastisement and they would have welcomed that instead of just wanting to get out of it by whatever means they could secure. Time and time again, God had to punish them and restore them again to his way of salvation through his prophets. And by his faithfulness, because he continued to do that, there was always a remnant among them that, that did seek the Lord. As God promised to Abraham that there would be. When Jesus finally came, we have before us the situation at which we are looking today, in the text today, where they chose Barabbas rather than Jesus. These were this Abraham's seed. They seek salvation by man to bring them political and economic liberty rather than salvation by Jesus Christ, who came to save them from their sin. We could go on with how the struggle between Barabbas and Jesus has continued in modern times, even in the New Testament church. The Reformation was a return to the pursuit of salvation that God gives, salvation by God, instead of salvation by popes and priests that had become the new Barabbas the way of salvation for the church by human effort. Barabbas, going forth, we will deliver you, look to us, we will deliver you. Buying indulgences, doing the rosary, going through the stations of the cross, uh, praying and, and touching our relics and, and, and giving prayers to the dead. These were ways of Barabbas salvation. And the Protestant church, however, Barabbas immediately began to emerge and came to a real, uh, the real forefront about 120 years ago. I mean, we could say well, long before that, but when it, Barabbas really emerged in a way that, that spread into almost all of the Protestant churches, when so many religious men in the name of Christ began to proclaim that war and poverty would end by their human schemes. They were going to abolish all of these things. They spoke of it in terms of the Bible, the new Jerusalem coming of age, the kingdom of God coming to fulfillment. There was one huge problem with their dreams, however. They ignored the problem of sin. They rejected the inspiration and the authority of the scriptures, and they trusted in the heart of man. By God's grace and the fruits of his spirit among the people, there had been growth among them in love and generosity and morality and integrity so that they had a moral foundation that was built into them out of which they were operating. But these kingdom seekers attributed these fruits to the innate goodness of man, ignoring the fact that we are ruined by the fall and that we need redemption. They began to downplay the cross and, to call, and the call to holiness, except that they continued to promote good deeds to neighbors. They were pretty good on doing that, you know, helping those that are in need. That was their focus. But in other ways, they began to downplay real holiness before God in worship and in integrity and heart. 
they began to institute worship according to the dictates of their own hearts, presuming that the light that they had could only bring forth goodness. They downplayed confessions and creeds, presuming that truth comes from within rather than from the word of God on which those creeds were based. This all led to confusion and immorality that we have today. What does the broader church believe, the broader Protestant church, what does it believe today? What is the morality like in that church? This is what the light of man has brought forth. This is what Barabbas, following Barabbas, has brought forth. All the while pretending that we are enlightened as we begin to say that things that are abomination to God are actually pleasing to God. Things like abortion or gay marriage or practice of homosexuality or such things. Jesus continues to stand through all the ages as the only name by which men can be saved. So now let's consider him. Salvation is not to be found from ourselves. We don't have it within ourselves, either to atone for sin or to turn our hearts to God and keep them there, to walk according to his will. Nor can we even do things that we presume that we could do. There was a rude awakening when the two world wars broke out. They, they said there wouldn't be any more war. And when poverty struck, when the, there was the Great Depression, and all their dreams, the Titanic sunk, all the things that, that they thought of them in their pride. That's where uh, neo-orthodoxy emerged. It doesn't have such a high view of man. It's got a defective view of God too. But it doesn't have a, such a high view of man as the liberal theology before had. You see, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is the one that we preach to the nations and to our own people. He is our hope. Through all the ages, there have been those who look for a city whose builder and maker is God. Many of them have already been mentioned. Abel, Noah, Abraham. There's Moses and David and the prophets, of course, that could also be mentioned. Always there were those that God kept. In the early church, there were those who continued looking to him, even though they were put in prison and tortured and burned in the Colosseum. They did not cower when called before rulers and governors, but they testified faithfully and served their master without deviation. King Jesus, who saves his people from their sins, and they boldly proclaimed that, that he was Lord and not Caesar that he would judge the world at the last day. They held to his truth when heretics came, and even in the church, and denied that Jesus was fully God. Or before that, when it was popular for them to say that he had not come in real human flesh. Or when they turned from the living God to dead idols and icons, and they began to trust in Barabbas to save them, instead of what God had appointed, instead of Jesus to save them. They began to look to men and priests rather than God and His truth. They are the ones who preach. These faithful ones are the ones who preach salvation by grace through faith. Who translated the Bible into the language of the people. And who preached to the people so that they could understand the gospel and the call of God. They condemned the immorality, the extravagance, and the pride. The sacrilege and the elevation of men to high seats like the papacy that Christ never appointed. They turned from man-made salvation to salvation proclaimed by the apostles in the Holy Scriptures. And I say, even to this day, there remain those like them who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation. Those who choose Christ instead of Barabbas. Christ is the one we want not the salvation that comes by man's efforts. Yes, I can tell you, you must all make that choice. Either you look for salvation from this world and in this world by Barabbas, or you look for the salvation that Christ alone can give you, reconciliation by His blood and eternal life through His grace. Oh, that God might open your heart 
that you might see that it is vain and futile for you to seek any other salvation. And it's blessed to look to Christ. The decision boils down to two things. What are you looking for, first of all? And secondly, how do you expect to attain it? You can be looking for the right thing initially, but looking in the wrong way to attain it. And on the other hand, you could not even be looking for the right kind. Like they were looking for deliverance from Rome was their primary concern, where God's primary concern was Jesus came to give his life a ransom and to call many to repentance. So if you're looking for deliverance from sin, choose Christ is the only one who can save you. Or you ought to choose him and not some other scheme. No one else can do that. And if you really are looking for that, then you will be true to Christ. If you're looking to deliverance from, if you're looking for deliverance from things you don't like in this world, you will look to man to save you. You know, look, look down in the States. With, you, you see the polarization. There's people that are looking for salvation from one political side and those who are looking for salvation from the other political side. And it is not the salvation that God has. They say, we will be free if we have this president. We will be free if we have that president. This is not where salvation comes from. Salvation comes from the living God. I tell you, eternal salvation is about walking with God in obedience to Him through the things of this world, the, the chastisements and things that He brings. Many, man cannot deliver us at last. Man cannot save us from our sins. Only Jesus can do that. So which one do you want? Barabbas, who promised prosperity and freedom and peace now? Is that what you crave for? Prosperity and peace now? If only I could have what I want now? Or Jesus Christ? who atones for your sin and reconciles you to the Father forever and makes you forgiven and holy. I say as he said, what will you profit if you gain the whole world and lose your own soul? Why would you pursue something that God has not given you to pursue for your salvation? What is it that you want? So how do you go about choosing Jesus instead of Barabbas? I sound like an Arminian here. You know, as, uh, as Reformed people, we believe that man is called to choose. That he, he's called to choose Christ. That's the commandment. All men everywhere are commanded to repent and believe the gospel. What we also believe is that they can only do that by the grace of God from start to finish, from inception all the way to the end. It's only by the free grace of God. I hope I have convinced you that you ought to choose Christ, or rather that God the Holy Spirit has convinced you. But how can you have him? Well, it begins with a definitive choice that you will serve him, Jesus, instead of Barabbas. Outwardly, you embrace him by baptism and profession with your mouth. By baptism, you declare that you are looking to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to wash you and your children from sin. The symbol is not a symbol of obtaining houses and lands and peace and prosperity that you want in this world or great riches in this world. You don't come to Jesus and he hands you a, a, a checkbook or something and says, you know, this is a symbol of the prosperity that you're going to have. No, he cleanses you with water when you come to him because that's what you need. And you should be glad then if you have very hard times, whatever God may send to you that accomplishes and brings forth that purpose instead of always looking and scheming for how you can find some deliverance from whatever it is you want to be delivered of. It is the symbol of cleansing with water, signifying the cleansing by His blood. He who was crucified to atone for our sins and the cleansing by the Holy Spirit, which He gives to us to wash away our sin and corruption. He gives you and your children a bath when you enter into His kingdom. He has to do the washing. 
We baptize with water. He baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And in connection with your baptism, what do you do in this inception of coming to Jesus? Will you profess with your mouth that he is your Lord and your Savior in whom you trust? You come among his people and you confess before them that that you are now with Jesus, that you are no longer with Satan and the world, not Barabbas, not yourself, not other men, but you are looking to Christ to save you. You renounce sin and you promise to follow him as his disciple. And you commit yourself to his people, submitting to those that he has appointed to oversee his church, his shepherds in the local congregation, promising to seek the peace and purity and prosperity of the people of God. Those who are baptized as children make this profession when they come to years of maturity to do so. And those who are already of age make this profession when they are baptized, if that is when they come to the Lord. Some of you here are emerging adults that were baptized as babies who need to consider if the time has come for you to profess your faith and assume yourself for yourself the responsibility whereby you would examine yourself and follow the Lord and take the 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 responsibility for that that your parents assumed for you when you were baptized but of course all of this is in vain if you do not believe in your heart that jesus is lord and if you do not look to him in faith for salvation in other words you must be sincere in your outward profession an outward profession is what all of the those who chose barabbas had You must be one who realizes that your greatest need is for the salvation that Jesus gives rather than the salvation that Barabbas gives. And you must truly call upon the Lord to have mercy on you and to save you from your sins. The outward form of baptism and a profession of faith cannot save you. It is faith alone that saves you. Baptism and profession must be the outward expression of inward faith and repentance of turning to Jesus for mercy and looking to Him to reconcile you to the Father forever. It is a definitive choice. And if that baptism and that profession of faith is not there, then there's no reason to think that you somehow believe in your heart if you do not identify with the Savior. You don't have to know the time and date, but you must have the trust in Him alone and the commitment to Him as your Lord and Master. Sitting on the fence will not do. As the scriptures warn us, choose this day whom you will serve. Will it be Barabbas or will it be Jesus? Will it be Baal or will it be the Lord? Will it be salvation by man or will it be salvation by the true Son of God? So yes, the relationship is one that you enter into in a definitive way You choose Christ openly and publicly, and you embrace Him in your heart. Now, with this definitive choice, there must also be an ongoing daily choosing of Jesus instead of Barabbas. Because as a people of faith, we still have temptation that comes to us. Jesus calls those who are His to take up their cross daily. That's why it's so important for you to to feed upon His Word and to take time in prayer. Each day you must choose Him instead of the way of man and man's promises. Otherwise, you'll find yourself looking for the salvation that man promises in this world. And all in vain. This is how you show the truth of your profession is by taking up your cross daily. You you did to yourself and you, you live for Him who gives you life with the Father, renewing you more and more each day in righteousness and holiness after His image in the knowledge of Him. There is more love. There is more obedience day by day by day as you serve the Master. Not that there are no bad days or bad seasons when you seem distant to the Lord, when you are distant to the Lord. But these must never become the norm. It's not a place to settle, even for a day. If they do, it may be that there is in you a false heart 
of unbelief and departing from the living God. Brethren are warned in Hebrews to take heed lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. There is no way to tell if you are not presently walking with the Lord. If your salvation is some salvation other than the salvation that Jesus brings, if you have chosen Barnabas rather than him, then you need to repent and you need to turn back. See, there are those little choices every day too that add up and make such a difference. Will I go with Jesus? Right now, will, will I read the Word? Or will I go and uh, look at my social media and, and, and engage in, in that? When that choice is a little choice. What am I going to do here? What, it, what is important to me? Barabbas? The comfort I get from Barabbas? Or from the Lord Jesus Christ? Will I take time to pray? Or will I pursue my, some other interest? Will I take that? I'm at the table. I've already eaten too much. Will I take that extra piece of cake, that extra helping, that drink, when I've already had enough to drink? Will I indulge in that sinful fantasy that I'm carrying about in my mind? Will it be Barnabas? Or will it be Jesus? Will I indulge those fears that I have? And make them the dominant thing instead of the goodness and the promise of God. Whenever you're afraid, trust in the Lord. We often find ourselves afraid in these days. When you're afraid, don't indulge those fears and wallow in them. Turn out of them and look to the God who has promised salvation to you. The God who is good. The God who is holy. The God who is righteous. Salvation is in Him. And say, yes, Lord, even if it is your will to drag me through hard times in order that I might grow. Not my will, but your will be done. That's where freedom comes from. That's when Christ is chosen rather than Barabbas. Will I indulge in that pity party about how hard my life is? Or will I pursue service to Christ? Forget about how hard your life is. You are called to be His servant, to die to yourself and to walk with Him. Will I speak to that neighbor about Him? Or will I go with Barabbas? Will I let my anger loose? Or will I rein it in and speak words that honor the Lord? Will I indulge in bitterness against those who have wronged me? Or will I turn to my master and seek to love them and do good to my enemies? This daily choice is also encompassed by the weekly Sabbath where you come and commune with your Lord and and rest in the salvation and refocus yourself in the salvation for He has chosen you. It is a day when you come to remember afresh that what He has done for you to save you and how He has graciously called you and kept you and kept His people. On that day in particular, you receive His Word through the public ministry of the Word preached. You embrace Him afresh in the sacrament, renewing your commitment to Him as He refreshes your walk and, and makes, you, makes Himself known to you. He has appointed the weekly assembly, and you dare not skip it unless you have good reasons for doing so. What do you skip it for? Barabbas. Something that gives you comfort in the world. You choose something else. Some of you have settled for only one service, but God has appointed morning and evening for His people. The morning and evening sacrifice on the Lord's Day. Surely you know that it would be better for you. Don't turn the day into a half Sabbath when He has given you a whole Sabbath to be kept holy to the Lord. It's a choice between Barabbas and the Lord. And speaking of that, there are those temptations that come to your life There are major turning points in your life where you set a direction in one way or another way. Will I take that job that I know will compromise my relationship with God? It can have a huge effect. Maybe it's a job somewhere where there's no Christian fellowship. Will I enter into that relationship with someone that I'm attracted to who doesn't really love God? But I find them attractive. Barabbas or Christ. Which is it to be? It can have a huge effect on the rest of your life. So many sorrows. I was, I was talking to 
uh, Elder Dave Alexander uh, the other day about that, that, you know, as I get older and I see someone making that kind of choice. When I was, when I was younger, I used to think, you know, it looked kind of appealing. And now seeing the fruits of so many people that have gone down the wrong pathway, it, it, it grieves me. It makes me lament to see that. Will I take up that affair? Or will I go with Christ? Will I go into debt to satisfy my desire for that nicer house? Or that car that I really can't afford? Or will I restrain so that I can honor Christ with my tithes and with my offerings? So that I can support those in need? Will it be Christ or Barabbas? The crowd made a very sorry choice that day when they chose Barabbas. For some of them, that was the defining choice for the rest of their life. They continued living on for this vain world that could never satisfy them, and they died in their sins. Some of them died in the insurrection. Of course, Rome came down hard upon the Jews, and those who followed Barabbas did not prevail in that day. They were crushed. Truly, the fire will not be quenched, and the word of conscience the, the worm of conscience will gnaw away at them forever in all eternity who died in their sins. But there were surely others who, although they chose Barabbas on that wretched Friday, later chose Jesus, perhaps even on the Sunday of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was poured out and they heard the gospel proclaimed when they saw to their shame that they had rejected God's way of salvation, God's Christ, who had come to save them from their sins in the vain pursuit that they had of earthly deliverance by Barabbas. They saw what wretches they were to reject Christ, delivering Him up to be crucified in exchange for a man who is sinful flesh. In choosing Him, what the delight it must have given them to think that just as Jesus took the place of Barabbas on that cross and died instead of him, so he had taken their place, bearing their sins, who had even delivered him up to be crucified. What love, what comfort, what assurance, what joy belonged to them when they came to him, even having before rejected him. Not only because of what he had done for them while they were yet sinners, but that even now that he would freely embrace them as soon as they turned to him, even they who delivered him up to the place of Barabbas. Like them, you may have made sorry choices as well. Indeed, you have made sorry choices along the way. But like them, if you come to Jesus, he will pardon you and he will receive you he will grant you repentance. It doesn't matter what you have done. The reason that he went to the cross was not for the righteous, but because we're not righteous. He went there to save sinners. Not the righteous, but sinners who are not looking merely for relief from the hardness of this world, but for deliverance from sin in order to walk with God. He is a, his is a sure and a grand deliverance. There's a crazy irony in all of this, isn't there, that happened here with Jesus and Barabbas. Pilate was the man with all the worldly power be behind him, but he completely lost control and had to give himself up to the will of the Sanhedrin. And the Sanhedrin, they were supposed to be those who shepherded God's people. They were supposed to represent God. Yet they rejected the one that God had promised. However, in doing so, they helped the one that God had promised to accomplish his purposes. And the mob who rejected Christ, they also rejected. They were the people of God, and yet they rejected the only one who could save them for another. But in so doing, they also helped him to accomplish his saving work. The irony is everywhere. The only one who got what he wanted in this whole scene was the prisoner who was battered and bruised and who was delivered up to be crucified. By this, 
He bore the sin of the world. He bore the sin of his people and he redeemed them, which is what he purposed and came to do. He gave them eternal life and reconciliation with God forever by the cross. By this, he glorified the Father, showing his honor, justice, mercy, love, wisdom, power, goodness, and grace to the whole world. He said as he went to the cross, now I glorify you. Glorify me that I may glorify you. The outcome for the world is that whoever believes in Jesus crucified and raised will not perish, but have everlasting life. Because just as he physically took the place of Barabbas, so before the Father, he took the place of guilty sinners, the guilty sinners that he came to redeem. And redeem them he has. Choose him, and you will not be disappointed. Choose Barabbas, and you will be ruined. Please stand and let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for putting it clearly before us how the, the people that stood before Pilate were given a choice by Pilate. Who do you want? The king of the Jews or Barabbas? And Lord, we know that, that we face that same choice every day in our lives as your people. You know, those who hear the gospel and are called to come to Christ, they hear it in a way that calls them to a definitive decision, to a choice. Will they come and follow Christ? Will they be baptized and profess his name? Will they repent of their sin and believe in their heart that God has raised him from the dead for their justification? Or will they go with the salvation and the things that the world promises? And Father, we who have come and who have embraced Jesus Christ, we also face the choice between Barabbas and Christ day by day. Sometimes we face it in bigger ways that set the trajectory for where we go from here. Other times, it's in those little things that mount up so quickly. Father, how quickly the choice to indulge in social media or something as opposed to read the Word of God day after day after day, how it accumulates, what effect it has. To choose the pity party, to choose the bitterness, to choose whatever it is that we think somehow from this we will find comfort when you call us to something altogether different by your grace. We pray, Lord, that you would enable us, that you would help us, that we would see clearly the way. Father, that you would grant us the strength to follow the way. We would confess that we cannot do anything without your help. Jesus said it. He said, without me, you can do nothing. When he was telling us to bear fruit, he made it clear that it's fruit that you bring forth when we cast ourselves into your care, into your hands. So we pray, Lord, that we would learn to do that. We pray, Lord, that even now as we prepare to come to the table, that we would come and we would cast ourselves upon you, Lord, that you would give us the desires that we ought to have, that you would give us the faith that we ought to have, that you would give us the strength that we need in order to do your will and to serve you in this world. Father, you did not promise that if we followed you that we would have the things that the TV preachers tell us we will have. You told us rather that we would have much tribulation. And we pray, Lord, that knowing that, that we would rejoice in what you send to us and that we would learn what you would have us to learn, that we would grow, that we would become strong. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness to us. We ask your blessing now. In Jesus' name, amen. Quite an interesting thing, isn't it? Breath upon the scales. That's, that's man's strength. Now, let's talk about God. 
receive his blessing. Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, to God alone who is wise, be glory and honor forever and ever. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen.